Thanks to subscribers Russell and Vulpine Deity for suggesting Slavic mythology. If any of you have your own suggestions as to which video I should do next, leave it in the comment section below. Though I think I already know which one I'm obligated to do after this. The Slavic people are perhaps the most eccentric collection of human beings on the face of the planet. They've had many cultural quirks which pretty distinctively identify them from the rest of Europe and Southern Asia, such as an addiction to vodka, a fascination with bears, an experimental past with communism, unicycles, Adidas tracksuits, hard bass, babushkas, fiddlers hanging out on strangers' rooftops, vodka, Eurobeat, fur, labor camps, a general dislike for Germans, folk dancing, slapping terms, tournaments, vodka, AK-47s, wearing a gas mask when there is literally no reason to do so, anti-semitism, vodka, extremely short courting periods, squatting, a recently developed disdain for communism, defining generations based on the legalization of American soft drinks then shamelessly ripping off said soft drinks, vodka, and a dish I grew up with and adore, though I am thoroughly convinced is only enjoyed by white people. Prove me wrong in the comments section. And yet, while what I just described probably painted a vivid picture in your mind of a stereotypical Slav, these people historically do not not like each other very much. Go figure. However, unlike the Asians who all hate each other due to vastly different cultural practices and stints of imperialism spurred on by a sense of ethnic nationalism, the Slavic people are all thought to have originated from a single tribe of people from around the Carpathian Mountains, the majority of which are focused in modern-day Romania before spreading out all over the place, widely dispersing themselves from the Balkans all the way out to here in Russia. And while the Slavs generally broke up into several different ethnic groups, including including but not limited to the Ukrainians, Russians, Polacks, Czechs, Slovakians, Belarusians, Serbians, and Croatians, their languages have remained strikingly similar to the point where they can oftentimes follow much of what they are trying to say to one another. For better or for worse. So, you'd think with this shared cultural genesis that there would be an awful lot of similarities within their respective faiths. Right? Actually, yes! To the point where any given Slav practices one of two faiths. Eastern Orthodox or Plain Jane Catholicism? Pick your poison. So I won't sugarcoat things for you guys. There is actually very little known about Slavic mythology, and what we do know definitively is viewed through the scope of later Christian writings in the region, as up until that guy Notorious B.I.G. wanted to share a title with came into the region, it's thought that the Slavic people had no system of writing to speak of. This means that if there are certain commonalities between the Slavic states and their folklore, we cannot conclusively state whether or not these myths arose from the Carpathian Mountains, or if they developed independently after the split into smaller and not-so-smaller nations, with a distrusting nationalism-driven outlook on the others. However, it is thought that at some point or another, the original Aryan races coming from North Central Europe had quite a bit of contact with either the original Carpathian tribes or the early migratory tribes spreading out into regions of Europe which the Aryans would have had to have been literally blind and retarded to miss, leaving behind some very apparent mythological concepts which definitively relate them to Germanic and Norse mythology. After all, I don't think a hammer-wielding god of thunder Sky Daddy and a universe-containing divine tree is something a whole bunch of different people separated by hundreds of miles of geography would have been able to come up with independently. However, it still bears mentioning that the Slavic faiths are incredibly individualistic and are mainly defined by later cultural tales, which are more than likely based off of historical events unique to that region. A prominent example being Poland and the legend of the Wawel dragon in Krakow. This tale is pretty much exclusive to the then capital of the nation and does not seem to share any similarities with other Slavic tales from the time. To best explain this, I guess I'll have to go into a side tangent and summarize the story. So a long time ago, presumably somewhere in the 7th to 8th centuries, for a reason I'm about to get into here in just a moment, the then capital of Poland, Krakow, was under siege by a dragon living in the cave at the foot of Wawel Hill. Every week, the dragon demanded tributaries of cattle, otherwise the beast would ride into town and gobble up the villagers. However, because livestock takes a lot longer than just a week to replenish, 
the town eventually began to worry that all of their herds would soon be devoured by the dragon, and they would subsequently starve or be forced to feed their children to the mighty beast. The king, a fellow by the name of Krakus, called his two sons to figure out a way to slay the dragon and free their city. And so the brothers devised a pretty clever plan where they would bring the dragon livestock smeared with sulfur. After the dragon had finished eating them, his stomach acid sparked the sulfur and caused him to breathe a stream of fire. Hence why dragons can breathe fire. Oh no! The dragon, attempting to save himself, drank and drank from the nearby Vistula River. However, like a fat woman on her cheat day, the dragon couldn't help himself from drinking all the water and eventually his stomach burst killing the creature, but winning his children a Nintendo Wii. The brothers then proceeded to celebrate for about five minutes until they started arguing, as siblings do, as to whose idea it was to feed the dragon the jihadist lamb. And so, the older brother, whose name was Lech, killed his younger sibling, a young man by the name of Krakow. Upon arriving home, Lech was crowned king and told everyone that the dragon had eaten Krakow. However, further evidence came out exposing Lech as a liar, and he was run out of town. Afterwards, the villagers agreed to name their city after the fallen brother Krakow. As delightful a bedtime story this is to traumatize small children with, it is thought to be inspired by the invasions of the Avars riding into Europe, whom had tenuous relations with the Polacks at best, and were thought to lay siege and demand tributaries of the people of Krakow, who responded in kind by feeding them exploding sheep. As any good Slav would do. However, there is a bit of a coincidence here which I absolutely need to point out. So, the Avars are a semi-nomadic people who in the grand scheme of things didn't really change much and came from an unknown region of the world to primarily fight against the Franks. However, it is thought that the part of the legend of the Vavel dragon where he threatened to eat the villagers was inspired by these people demanding human sacrifices to their gods. You know, from the mythology of the Avars. An Avarian mythology, perhaps? Hmm? Wait till I write a myth about the Avarians riding up into Poland with a literal fucking dragon. However, you can kind of start to see my point. The quote-unquote Slavic countries are very widely spread out, and while their linguistic structure is very similar, their myths evolve separately from their tradition of buying out entire Adidas stores based on their own separate experiences. Tack on about 12 centuries of Korean Jesus demanding these people get swole in the name of God, and you have a puzzle box filled with odds and ends pieces from completely different sets trying to make the figurative Bob Ross painting, which was sprayed over by a figurative Banksy some centuries later, and you have a pretty good idea of how insurmountable a task it is to reconstruct elements of the unified Carpathian tribe's mythology. That being said, I'm no spitter and quitter. There are a few themes from the ancient religion we can glance from Slavic mythology, at least from the pre-Christian era, which I'd presently like to introduce you to. Oh, but Messiah! I hear you asking while this window is just playing audio and you're jacking off to something on the internet which I don't even want to imagine right now. How can you tell what an ancient religion was like just based off of a few surviving stories? Shut up, I'm about to explain. So when it comes to ancient religions, they are usually based in one of three different categories. Sometimes a combination of two or all three. And these are ancestor worship, animism, and fertility worship. The only real exceptions to this rule are the monotheistic religions, however I'm about to ruin somebody's day by saying I don't consider Judaism to be an ancient religion, as when the first books of the Bible were being written, they were still polytheistic, borrowing gods from ancient Canaan as often as they could until they decided to go full Facebook official with Yahweh. A similar thing probably happened with Zoroastrianism, and as far as our historical records can tell us, the Egyptian cult of solar worship was just a one-time thing. So it is my belief that the Slavic peoples, possibly even before the Aryan migrants made their way into their territories, were practitioners of ancestor worship, evidenced by the commonality of the Domovoi, a house spirit who is known by many a Slavic culture 
just under different, albeit very similar names. The Domovoi were thought to originally be residents of the heavens until they decided to all gather together and rebel against Savarog, who is kind of the god of smithing, though is sometimes conflated with their supreme sky papa deity. Of course, the Domovoi lost and were cast down to Earth, with frightening accuracy by whoever the hell threw them down there, because every single one of them landed in the chimney of a home and was said to have taken up permanent residence from there. However, the ancient Slavic people seemed not only indifferent to the spirits, but actually appreciated having them around, almost like an extension to their very own family, with the children of the house commonly referring to them as grandfather. Likewise, the Domovoi became quite attached to the people of the house, and was seen as a protective spirit who would forewarn the family of an impending tragedy. For example, if someone were to die in the house because the infant mortality rate was so damn high and Slavic winters are more brutal than getting up for work early with a hangover, the Domovoi could be heard at night weeping to himself, lamenting the loss which was to come. And if a woman of the house was about to be beaten by her husband, the Domovoi would try to warn her by tugging on her hair, then proceeding to do absolutely nothing while he slaps the shit out of her. This association with a hearth spirit being a guardian of the home is nothing new, nor is the association of a deceased loved one protecting a domicile, though it could be argued that the Domovoi was especially important in Slavic cultures as winters in Russia tend to get quite a bit nasty, and so it's probably not a good idea to piss off the guy living in your fireplace. Also, presumptively tack on animism to the Slavic culture as many other aspects of the home get their own slightly less benevolent spirits. Domovika Spirit of the Basement, Devorovoi, uh, fucking hell, I, 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 I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm, I'm only the bad kind of Slavic, I, I'm, I'm just a little Polish boy, I can't pronounce these words. Uh, th this thing is a spirit of the yard, Banik, spirit of the bath, and Ovenik, the spirit of the barn. These are just a few examples of how even the most mundane of aspects in peasant life were given personifications. As for the fertility worship aspect, it's kind of up in the air. As the god of fertility, Yarlo, aside from being the subject of an ancient hostage exchange, where the god of the underworld captures him and forces him to spend half the year down there, doesn't seem to be very popular considering that there is very little written about him and while he does have some spring and summer festivals attributed to him, they basically consisted of the people getting up out of their homes and taking a walk around the village. He definitely had a presence in the Slavic community, however his lack of mention from the Christian missionaries is troubling. Keep in mind, basically all of our knowledge on Slavic mythology is limited to Christian sermons railing against the pagan gods. So evidently, the missionaries really didn't give much of a fuck about Yarlo, and that speaks volumes as to his importance among the Slavic people at the time of their Christianization. Speaking of influences, as mentioned earlier, a later revision to Slavic mythology is thought to have been the migration of the Aryan, or Proto-European, for the paper-skinned pansies, peoples, who, if you know anything about anthropology, are supposedly responsible for the development of every Indian, dot not feather, and Europe European language ever to exist, as well as over half of all the Mediterranean cultures, though in reality this is merely a half-truth. From these migrants, the Proto-Slavic language and culture was thought to develop, and alongside them, their pantheon of deities, most notably Perun. Yeah, remember that deity I mentioned earlier who is effectively Thor because he wields a hammer, controls the elements of the sky, and is known as the god of thunder? Yeah, that was Perun. Or as he was known to some Slavic tribes, Grom. Perun is very similar to a multitude of other celestial deities, and while his iconography is very similar to Thor's, he is more akin to the Finnish god Uko, who coincidentally enough, my Finnish friend Antti Palosari has already done a video on over at his channel, which I will be leaving a link to in the description down below. And one of those little annotations which pop up in the right hand corner right over here. 
I don't know, people never click on these anyway. Both Perun and Uko take inspiration from the theoretical god Perkunos, who was the Aryan weather deity, but also played double duty as his denotion as a sky papa or deus Peter is also integrated into his cultural identity. Perun is among only a small handful of Slavic deities, which are universally recognized throughout all of the pre-Christian Slavic peoples as the supreme deity of the land. Later on, his image was changed again by the Persians to better represent their supreme deity Ahura Mazda as a purely benevolent being in contrast to Velez, who was vilified and equated to Ariman. Velez is another one of those deities who is universally recognized by Slavs all over. And despite what this religion, which I can't seem to stop referring back to in any one of my videos may tell you, is a bit more of a morally gray, arguably good god. That's not to say I personally blame the Persians for targeting Verun as the antithesis to Perun. Verun is a thonic god, choosing to make his dwelling in the land of the dead, Nav or Nawia. It doesn't help Verun's image that he was the one who captured the aforementioned Slavic fertility god Yarlo Get and dragged him to the underworld so that the brutal Eastern European winters could settle in. By all accounts, this guy is a dick. Except, not really. Well, depending on who you ask. You see, contrary to our bastardized understanding of mythological underworlds as places of gray, depressing, catacomb-like realms where the light of day almost never shines, Nav is a bit different, as it is described as a wide-open grassy plain adorned with beautiful flowers, a diverse array of plant life, and at the center of it all, a vast oh, swamp yeah. which hosts the roots of a cosmic tree which binds all three eternal realms together with its roots, trunk, and branches, each respectively housed within Nav, Yawia, the realm of the living which as you can see is impaling this poor wolf, and Prawia, the celestial realm. Within this same swamp, Velez sits upon a very out-of-place golden throne with a sword, where he guides newly deceased spirits out onto the fields of green to roam about care free. Also, unlike the rest of world mythology, the spirits of the dead are not bound to the underworld, and could come and go as they pleased, periodically making visits to their loved ones in Yawia in the form of various different species of birds, depending on the season. As for Velez himself, it's entirely thanks to him that the afterworld is such a paradise. As his capture of Yarlo, it's thought to be the catalyst by which the underworld blooms so beautifully especially during the winter, where the god is sent half the year to maintain the greenery. In fact, if you really want to get into things here, I'd argue that the Zoroastrianism-inspired Slavic mythology has it backwards, where Velez is supposed to be the good god, while Perun is more of an apathetic, almost dickish god. Velez captured Yarlo so that in the afterlife, the souls of the departed could enjoy warm, wide-open fields, as opposed to Yawia, which is cold, miserable, and full to the brim with douche tubers, Instagram influencers, and worst of all, literally anyone who uses Twitter. And this is all supposedly under the watchful eyes of the gods led by Perun, who really don't care about humanity most of the time, and instead choose to reside over their ivory tower in Prawia. Velez is literally the only one who cares. Can we get some hashtag justice for Velez in the comments? Because they have massacred my boy's reputation. However, if you're looking for a much more literal and childlike interpretation of dualism in Slavic culture, the German monk Helmold describes a strange, never-before-since corroborated cult among the Polish Slavs worshipping two opposing deities, Bielbog, the white god who represents good luck, and Chernobog, the black god representing misfortune. This oversimplification of their attributes, as well as the fact that Helmold was the only missionary who could have noted the existence of these deities given the time frame in which he lived, has led many to speculate the legitimacy of these gods, pondering on whether Bielbog and Chernobog were simply machinations of Helmold's mind, or if it was entirely a misunderstanding of the relationship between Perun and Velez. Now, there are a multitude of other minor and regional Slavic gods, but like I said earlier in the video, these deities are basically elemental and cultural aspects of various different Slavic peoples spread out all over the fucking place. And so it's not really fair for me to label them as a collective 
Slavic mythology. Maybe I'll return to each of the major tribes of Slavs in a later video, as well as their respective pantheons. Or perhaps, if you ask nicely, another friend of the channel, Katya Pavlova, who has helped me out immensely in making this video by sharing some of her English sources on Slavic mythology, may fulfill those burning, itching desires for knowledge you feel in your loins, as Katya hosts a channel dedicated solely to the study of Slavic mythology and folklore and has a much nicer and charming accent than I do. So please, go and check out her channel. I will list it in the description down below next to Auntie's. I'd actually consider it a personal favor if you went and checked them out, as they are among the small pool of mythology creators I actually respect. Speaking of, thanks for watching today's video. If you made it to this point, why not show your support with a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Thanks again to these beautiful Patreon names over here. If you'd like to support the channel, this is the best way to do it. Just go down to the link down below and pledge whatever you'd like to gain access to my Patreon-only posts, polls, and behind-the-scenes previews for my videos. Discord is also linked in the description, so if you'd like to share some reading material with the class, or you'd like to read up on some extra sources, that's the place to be. Next month we'll be host to the Chinese creation story video, as voted by you guys, but I decided to make September more of an Asian-themed month, so you can expect two other Eastern Asian videos that month the Korean creation story, as well as the long-awaited Japanese mythology part 4. But until then, folks, my name is Messiah's Mythology, and I hope you all have a God's blessed day.